Uh, we, we started the service with perhaps the most famous psalm. The most famous hymn probably in the country is Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but uh, now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And that, of course, we saw last week, if you were here, was what the man who'd been born blind said. He said, one thing I know, I was blind, now I see. He knew the difference that Jesus had made in his life. And this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know something of that. You know what your life was like before you encountered Jesus, and you know what your life is like now. But back then and now, not everybody wants to hear that. We saw that last week in the opposition of the Pharisees to Jesus, and we'll see that uh, this week as well. Uh, There are some who want to perhaps sideline Jesus. There are some who perhaps want to relegate Jesus as one voice amongst many, one idea, one religious guru, uh, one thinker amongst many in the voices. There are some who want to get rid of Jesus altogether and actually have themselves as the sort of gatekeepers for true religion. But in this passage, Jesus makes two extraordinary claims about himself, two extraordinary statements that tell us about who he is and why he's come. He says that he's the gate, and he says that he is the good shepherd. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the first of those in order. Jesus says that he is the gate, and by that he means he brings us to God. He's the access to God. He he takes us um, to God. Now, for those of you who uh, perhaps haven't been here the last few weeks, the context is, over the last few chapters, particularly from chapter 8, we've seen, um, we've seen Jesus having conflict with the religious leaders, particularly on his identity as the Son of God. Last week we saw Jesus opening up the eyes of a man who'd been born blind, and the Pharisees concluded, having seen that evidence, that actually Jesus, they judged Jesus as a sinner. They judged the man and Jesus as a sinner. But the passage ended in the opposite way. The twist at the end of chapter 9 was Jesus saying that he was the son of man. He was the one who was to judge. And actually, they were the ones who were sinners, were blind with their guilt remaining. That's what we saw last week. And in fact, this passage of being the good shepherd follows immediately on from that. There's no real break. There's a break in our um, in our Bibles, in the NIV, uh, between chapter 9 and chapter 10. But there's no real break in the story because we see right at the end, verse 21 of chapter 10, they say, can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This is immediately following on from what we've seen in chapter 9 of Jesus opening the eyes of the blind man. And the way that this passage in chapter 10 works is in the first five verses, Jesus tells a story uh, an illustration, a parable. This is probably as close as it gets to a parable in John's Gospel. He, he tells us sort of a story, a parable. Then there's some confusion in verse 6. They don't understand what he's talking about. And so verse 7 onwards is Jesus explaining the story. And he's explaining, first of all, about him being the gate. Look at verse 1. He says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter into the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, verse 6 says. The picture here, the sort of illustration, the parable is, is of a courtyard. And perhaps you can imagine one. It's a, a courtyard, a pen for the sheep to be in. Perhaps you can imagine a big stone wall. Maybe there's sort of buildings, family buildings, farmyard buildings uh, around this sheep pen. And there's a right way and a wrong way of getting into the sheep pen. The wrong way is hopping over the wall. Hopping over the wall, we see. It says, um, uh, verse, uh, verse 1, Anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. There are those who jump over the wall, and they are thieves and robbers. They hop over. They don't go in the right way. They try to sneak in. And the reason they do that is to harm the sheep. Not to care for the sheep, but to harm them, to abuse them, perhaps to kill them. But then there's a right way to go through into the sheepfold, 
And the right way is through the gate, not hopping the wall, but going in through the right way, the gate. And then Jesus says very explicitly, verse 7, I am the gate for the sheep. Verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus is the gate. He says it twice. So we pick it up. He's the gate. He's the access point for the sheep. He's the way in. Verse 9 makes it clear he's talking about salvation. It says that very clearly in verse 9. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He's talking about eternal things. He's saying the way into salvation, the access point to being saved, is Jesus. He's the gate. He's the way in. If you like, the, sort of the, the sheepfold in this sort of illustration is, is, it, is salvation. It's, it's where the sheep um, flourish. It's where they are. It's where they live. It's, it's eternity. It's heaven. It's a new creation. It, it's, it's that imagery. The way into that, Jesus says, is through the gate, not hopping over the wall. Jesus is the gate. And he says, there's not many entrances. There's one entrance. He is the gate. Not a gate. Not one entrance point amongst many into the sheepfold. But the gate. The only true and valid path up the mountain to God, if you like. I am the gate, he says. The only entrance point for salvation. This is what he'll say explicitly in chapter 14, 14 verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me, he says. Or to use the language of chapter 10, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Now this is a direct pushback to what we saw last week with the religious leaders. Because in 934... The Pharisees say to the blind man, you uh, were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. The Pharisees, the religious leaders are acting as the gate, acting as a sort of entry point for the flock, deciding who is in and who is out. And they cast the man out as if they're the ones who get to decide who's part of the sheep and who's not, who's part of the, in the flock, who's part of the sheep pen or not. They're the ones that think that they decide. But it's not their job, is it? Who is the gate? Who is the entrance way? It's Jesus. Jesus is the gate, not the religious leaders. And in fact, it's interesting, in 934, the word that's used for throughout, they threw him out, is exactly the same word that Jesus uses in verse uh, 4, chapter 10, verse 4, when it says, um, he goes on ahead of them, he leads them out, he brought out his own. It's the same word. You see, the Pharisees are kicking the man out, thinking that they are the gate, Jesus is the gate, and actually he leads his people out. He is the one who decides who's in and who's out. He's the one that brings salvation, not anybody else. Um, now, this, this week on my uh, Instagram feed, I um, was brought on in the algorithm, uh, a picture, uh, some, a sermon extract from a Roman Catholic priest who was um, lombasting his congregation for not taking the Roman Catholic Mass enough. And the reason he said you ought to take Roman Catholic Mass is because you need to be saved. And you won't be saved unless you take Mass in the Roman Catholic Church. And at the same time, I was reading John chapter 10, where Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Salvation is not through religious leaders, a religious system... Jesus says, I am the access point. I am the way in. Whoever enters through me will be saved. If we want to be part of God's flock, we need to enter through the only entrance point, the gate, Jesus Christ, his son. There is no other way. In fact, Jesus says in verse 8, all others are inadequate. Verse 8, he says, all who have come before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep have not listened to them. There's a word in verse 8 that I find extraordinary. It's the word all. Jesus is immediately talking about the Pharisees, of course. They have come before him. They are thieves and robbers wanting to just destroy, manipulate. But, of course, Jesus is talking more than that. We saw in Ezekiel 34, 
God's indictment on the shepherds of Ezekiel's day, but they, they were harming. They were abusing. They were feeding on the sheep, not protecting and loving them. Jesus says, all who've come before me are thieves and robbers. In fact, all of the shepherds of the old covenant in the various different shepherding roles, even as the best ones compared to Jesus, are just thieves and robbers. Even the best shepherds of the old covenant, the time before Jesus, you think of perhaps Moses or David or Isaiah, or any of them, compared to Jesus, are nothing, are inadequate. Jesus is the gate. He is the one. He is the way in. All before him are thieves and robbers. That's why God promises in Ezekiel that one day he would provide a much greater shepherd, a shepherd who would truly shepherd the flock in the line of David. Jesus is that one. Jesus is the gateway. Now, of course, we know that in our um, 21st century Western culture, this is really profoundly challenging to people's way of thinking because you've probably had conversations, lots of conversations with people where perhaps um, people treat their sort of spirituality, their thoughts as very personal, very privatized, my truth, we might say. Um, people think that any sort of sincerely held religious view, as long as it's sincerely held and you're sort of true to yourself in the, in the Disney way, that that's okay, they might think. But what Jesus says in verse 9 is profoundly challenging to that. He says, I am the gate. I am the way to God. Not others, not other entrances around the sheep pen. He is the way in. He is the gate. He is the exclusive way for salvation. You might think at this point, well, why is it that Jesus is the only way. Why, if we, if we take that to be true, why in God's economy did he make it that Jesus is the exclusive way to coming to God? Well, back in chapter 1 of John's Gospel, um, we saw 1 verse 4, in him was life, John said. In Jesus is life. God is the fountain of life. He is the, the source of all that is good. In him is life. Blessing is found in God, in found in God's Son, the Messiah Jesus. There is no other place of life and blessing other than in Jesus, God's Son sent into the world. That's why it's no surprise, he says in verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Because life is found in Jesus, he comes to bring life because he is full of life. And he says, life to the full. Isn't that great? Not a half measure of life, he says. Not the sort of substandard, knockoff version, but real, full, enriching life, satisfying life. <coughs> or you might say in the language of John 4, um, living water. Something that will quench the heart, quench our thirst. Joy to the full. I think in many ways, um, John 10, verse 10, is the sort of New Testament equivalent of Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want. We shall not want when it comes to Christ. He leads us beside still waters. Christ refreshes our soul. Now, it may be that this morning you've been a Christian for some time. It may be that you're here and actually you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian. We all know in life, there are so many things which are competing for us to claim to offer life, to claim to be enriching, to claim to give us joy and promise life to the full, but actually, on closer inspection, they don't really satisfy us. It may be it's that career progression, and you think, if I just got that job, or I just had a new job, or I just worked my way up the ladder, then actually, that would be the thing. That would be the thing that would really help in life. My life would be sort of made if I got that. Or you think perhaps if I found a spouse, or I found a, a different spouse, or you think actually perhaps if I had children, actually then I would really, I would really be made in life. I would really be fulfilled. Or maybe you think actually it's, it's not that, it's just, you know, it's just a little bit more money in the bank account, a little bit more money in your pension pot. 
or whatever it is. Perhaps it's that your health would improve. Perhaps you'd get your health back to where it was five, ten years ago. Perhaps you'd lose some weight or be better looking or whatever it is. There are so many things that might actually offer us life, claim to be life-giving, and yet on closer inspection they're actually much more empty. Jesus says, I have come to bring life and life to the full, he says. The fullness of life is only found in Jesus because in him is life. He is the source of it all, the fountain of life. True life is in him. Living water. Jesus says, if we want to know God, if we want to come to be saved, if we want to avoid condemnation for our sins, if we want to have life-giving water, life to the full, in knowing God, Jesus is the gate. He is the way in. He is the entrance point for that. But he doesn't just stop there, because Jesus also goes on to say, he is the good shepherd. He lays down his life. In verse 10, we saw Jesus says he's come for the purpose of giving his people life, the only way that can happen is if he gives his life for us. We receive life because he dies. We receive life through his death. Verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Or verse 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Our life comes through his death. He lays down his life so that we can receive life and life to the full. Psalm 23 ended, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, the problem with that is you and I, by default, are not going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because the Bible says our, our sins, the things that we have done wrong, whether that's our attitudes, whether that's our thinking, whether that's our conduct, or the things that we should have done that we didn't do, they are what, what forms a barrier between us and God, so that we cannot come into God's presence. We cannot dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our sins are a barrier between us and God. And of course, that is why God sent his son into the world. That is why he has given his son, so that he can be the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, so that the sheep can receive life. He experiences death, we experience life. Life comes through the cross. That's the pattern. Through the cross, through death, through judgment, comes life. We receive life because he has offered himself. And we need to notice he has offered himself. He has given himself on the cross. Verse 17, I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, verse 18. I lay it down of my own accord. This is really important as we read John's gospel. Um, it may be a while before we get to John 19 and the crucifixion. But by the time we do get there, it's really important to remember what Jesus says here. He is going to be crucified. He is going to be arrested. He is going to be betrayed. The Romans will crucify him. He lays down his life. No one has done that. No one has taken his life from him. He lays down his life. It's his plan. It's his decision to die. He is choosing to do that. He gives himself on the cross. And the Father loves him. Because he is the Son who would willingly give himself for his people, his Father loves him and his Father sends him. Jesus dies, he lays down his life, and he has the authority to take it back up again. And there, is, there is nobody else who has the authority to come back to life again when they're dead. Jesus says, 
he has the authority to take his life back up again, even when he was dead. All these things the Father has given him to do. We've seen so many times in John's Gospel, the Gospel, Christ giving himself for us, the forgiveness of sins, being in his, uh, in his family, adopted into his family, being born again, having living water, however we want to describe it, all of those things are rooted in the Father's love for the Son, in the Son's love for the Father, in the Son sending the Spirit, rooted in eternal Trinitarian relationships. Because the Father loves the Son, he sends the Son. Because the Son loves the Father, he will do the works the Father has given him. He will die on the cross. Now here's a question for you. For those of you who like these things, who raised Jesus from the dead? Because Romans 8 says it was the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Acts chapter 2 says it was the Father that raised Jesus from the dead. And John 10 says it was Jesus who raised Jesus from the dead. So who was it that raised Jesus? Well, it was the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They worked together. Way back when we, we said this was what St. Augustine in whenever it was, sort of 1,600 years ago, called this the doctrine of inseparable operations. They operate inseparably. They work together, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father sends the Son. The Son does the works of the Father. He accomplishes the work of redemption. The Spirit applies the work of redemption. All three persons of the Trinity at work in our salvation. Jesus is the only way for salvation because he is the only one who could offer himself. He's the only one who would offer himself for our sins. He has paid the price. He has received death so that we receive life. Just look at the character of this good shepherd compared to others. Verse 12, he says, The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. The wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Why is it that Jesus protects the flock, lays down his life for the flock, and the hired hand doesn't? The hired hand, Jesus says, cares nothing for the sheep and does not own them. Precisely the opposite of Jesus. Jesus cares for the sheep. He loves the sheep. His heart is for the sheep. And he owns them. We belong to him. He is the creator. He has given us life. That is why as the good shepherd, he lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd who loves, who cares, who nurtures who protects, who guides, who in verse 4 goes on ahead of them. That's a, that's a lovely phrase. His leadership is going on ahead of the sheep. Not sort of whipping them from the rear, sort of pushing them along, but leading them from the front, going ahead of them, loving, caring, protecting, nurturing. <coughs> verse 14 says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Jesus knows you. What a thought that is. He knows you. In fact, even verse 15 says, that as the Father knows the Son, and as the Son knows the Father, he knows us intimately. He knows everything about us. He knows everything that you're going through. He knows all of your struggles. He knows all of your worries. He knows all of your anxieties. He knows the things about you that even your spouse doesn't know. Even your closest possible friend doesn't know. Jesus knows. He says, I know my sheep. He knows and he cares. And it means that even when we're perhaps going through very hard times, and it doesn't feel like we're in green pastures, nevertheless, Jesus knows us. Jesus cares for us. Jesus is with us. Jesus is the good shepherd who's even given himself for us. He knows his sheep and he cares for them deeply. I think as a, as a sidebar here, um, 
the character of the good shepherd is profoundly instructive and challenging for those in the church who are under shepherds, who are elders of this church, and particularly talking to five men here, although one of them's away, so Rosemary, you can, you can write some notes. F- five people in this church have the job of being under shepherds to the chief shepherd. Jesus is the supreme shepherd, but elders in the church are to exercise oversight as under shepherds of the chief shepherd. And the way that Jesus is shepherding his flock is the way that elders are to shepherd the flock. Loving, caring, nurturing, protecting, knowing the sheep, being with the sheep, the sheep knowing them. Embracing the sheep, modeling it, leading from the front, verse 4, going on ahead of them, not hitting the sheep with sticks from the rear. That's the call for elders in this church. It's profoundly challenging to love and nurture and protect the flock. But Jesus, as the chief shepherd, The good shepherd has a particular plan. And this plan, in verse 16, is the great cosmic plan of God. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And Jesus is talking about you in this verse. Um, unless you are of a Jewish background, he is talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about you. That the plan of God is Jesus is not just the good shepherd for the Jewish people, but for the Gentiles. That there would be one flock, one church of Jesus Christ, of Jew and Gentile. The cosmic plan of Jesus, the cosmic plan of God is to send his son, Jesus, into the world. So there is one shepherd and one church, one flock. God promised this in the Garden of Eden, that he would defeat the work of Satan. He promised it even more explicitly to the covenant with Abraham, where he promised that through Abraham's descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Through Abraham's offspring, which the New Testament says is singular, through Jesus, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God's plan is from every tribe, every language, every background, men and women, boys and girls would come to know the saviour, Jesus, that he would be the shepherd of the flock, including me, including you, the Gentiles, for whom the good shepherd has laid down his life. How do we respond to this? Well, in this passage, interestingly, there are two responses. We often see two responses to the work of Jesus. 19, the Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Some believe... Uh, Some are defending Jesus, some dismiss him, some reject him. But there's one characteristic in this passage of the sheep, of the flock, of those who belong to the shepherd. There's one thing in particular that gets mentioned several times. Verse 3, the sheep listen to his voice. Verse 4 ends by saying, His sheep follow him because they know his voice. Verse 5 says they don't follow a stranger because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Verse 16 says they too will listen to my voice. In verse 19, it says they don't believe Jesus' words. But Jesus' sheep do. They do believe his words. They listen to his voice. They listen to his words and they respond to his words. Followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, the sheep, that's not offensive, but we're sheep. The sheep of the flock hear the voice of the shepherd. 
They know his voice. They recognize it. They know that there's a warmth in his voice. They know that there's a tenderness in his voice, that there's a compassion, a love, a kindness, an authority in his voice. They know that voice. They don't listen to voices from elsewhere, a stranger's voice they're not interested in. They follow his words. They follow the words of Jesus. That is what we do as his sheep. We follow the voice of the good shepherd. Followers of Jesus are marked by an adherence to his words, to the things that he has revealed, whether they're the words specifically of Jesus or the words in the rest of this book that Jesus has inspired by the power of the Holy Spirit. If we're part of the flock, we listen to his words. Followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, are marked by a faithfulness to Scripture, to his voice. We have a book. Jesus has inspired a book by the power of the Spirit. Every word of it is his word. Every bit of it, without error, without mistakes, without contradiction, without corruption, Jesus' words are final. And we listen to his voice, whatever he's saying, whatever anybody else is saying. That's how we respond to the Good Shepherd. We listen to his voice. A voice which we've seen in John 10 encourages. A voice which sometimes exhorts or challenge, challenges and rebukes us. A word which preserves us, which leads us. A voice in scripture which tells us that Jesus is the good shepherd who's given himself for us. A voice that tells us that he loves us, that he knows us, and that he has offered himself for us. And we listen to his voice and we follow him. Let's pray before we sing. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he's done for us. We thank you that he's given himself. We thank you that he truly is the good shepherd. Father, we praise you and we thank you that life is found in him. We're sorry for the times when we've found life elsewhere. We confess our sins to you. We thank you that you have provided a way of salvation, that Jesus is that gate. Help us to trust in him. Help us to look to him. We pray that we would follow his voice, that he would lead us on, and that goodness and mercy would follow us all the days of our life. We thank you that in Christ that is wonderfully, wonderfully true. And we thank you for him. In Jesus' name, amen.